I am the artist community manager for So Far Sounds. My name is Billy Walsh. I'm joined here today by Eric Beal. Uh, he's an instructor for Berkeley Online of Music Publishing. Um, but yeah, really excited today to kick off this event all about understanding music publishing. Uh, Eric's taken the time to join us today where, yes, as I'd mentioned, he does teach music publishing online courses for Berkeley Online. Um, but Eric is also an author has written produced songs for artists like the Jacksons and Diana Ross. Uh, he's the former head of a and for Shapiro Bernstein, and that's one of the industry's most respected independent music publishers. So, ton of experience, huge resume for Eric. Really, really excited to have him today. Um, so thank you, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody for turning out all over the world. It's fantastic. Very excited. Right on. Yeah, we'll be covering uh, a laundry list of topics under the music publishing umbrella this afternoon, many of which have been requested directly from the attendees via the questionnaire that we sent out late last week. Uh, so I really wanted to just take a moment to thank everyone that submitted questions and content that they would like to see covered. Uh, your feedback and suggestions really does help us make this be exactly what the audience wants it to be. So it means a lot that people took the time to fill that out. And I think we've got a really great uh, topic conversations to cover off on today. We'll be using that first 45 minutes or so to uh, facilitate the discussion based on that content and questions that our attendees have submitted. And then we're going to make some time for open Q&A at the end for the last 15 minutes or so for Eric, um, just to answer any questions that other folks might still have lingering. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, but of course we're limited by time. So uh, please be patient with us if we can't get to your question and we'll figure out another way to get it answered if you need it. And again, we might not be able to get to all questions, but I encourage everyone to submit questions when they come up instead of just waiting until the end for Q&A so that if questions are sitting in the queue, we're able to filter those and get to those as quickly as we can. Uh, but don't be afraid to submit any questions if you have them. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So Eric, talking all about music publishing today, uh, just to kick off the conversation, I wanted to start by asking you what your definition of music publishing is, specifically for independent musicians who are still establishing themselves in the music industry. Um, how should they look at music publishing as a resource during these early stages of their careers based on that definition? Yeah, I think music publishing is one of those strange things where people People struggle sometimes to understand it, and, and a lot of times they make it more complex than it is. Um, the important thing to understand about music publishing is that it is your rights as it pertains to you as a songwriter. So that's something when you break it down that becomes pretty easy to understand because most of the people in this room probably either are, are songwriters, have written songs, um, or they represent people who write songs. Um, if you are play in a band or something and you don't write the songs, then music publishing is less relevant to you because music publishing is all related to the songwriter. So if you really take it back to, to its origins, think about that moment when you're working where you first came up with that idea for a song, where you, you literally scribbled something in your notebook a lyric in your notebook or you picked up the guitar and you fiddled around and you came up with an idea and then you started singing a melody or you were in your room and you put together a beat and you added some elements and all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is my creation. That's what music publishing pertains to, the song. It doesn't pertain to the recording of the song. It pertains to the song. So it's that moment of creation. And as soon as you've done that, as soon as you've scribbled those lyrics in your notebook, you, you control the copyright for that song. You are the songwriter, you've created this thing. We'll talk probably later about the process of actually registering a copyright, but, but the copyright exists the minute you write it in your notebook um, or the minute you play it on your guitar. So that, once that exists, there is a song there and you control it because you created it. And music publishing, is simply the process through which you control those rights and hopefully turn it into a business. And that's the important thing for independent musicians to understand. I always like to say songwriting is not a business. There's no actual money involved in songwriting. One day there was no song, today I picked up my guitar, I played something. 
voila, three hours later, here's a song. But no money changed hands. There's no transaction that happened. It's just, it wasn't there, now it's there. It's a piece of art. It's an art songwriting. Music publishing is the means by which songwriters can take that art and turn it into a business. So when I create that song, I control it but I can also license it to other people to use it, or I can put it out on records, but anyone that uses or puts that song out has to pay me, the songwriter, something. And that's what music publishing is. It's the means of monetizing that creative moment where you first wrote that song. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly, for independent musicians, it's one of the most important things that you have as a as an income stream for what you do mm -hmm. gotcha cool um yeah it makes sense and i think it's interesting to think of it from that perspective where people don't necessarily think that it's you know i've got notebooks and notebooks and notebooks full of lyrics for example and uh now that those are written down you don't necessarily put that into the publishing realm right away you know it's something that doesn't naturally come to an independent musician until it comes time to actually okay how do i monetize this how do i turn this into the, the business aspect that you were talking about that's a great way of looking at it exactly and a lot of musicians think of it as like well now i've put it out on the record so now i'll monetize Sure. You could monetize those lyrics in a number of different ways. I mean, you could, there are people who print lyrics on shirts. There are people who, you know, there, there are, um, you know, there are, you could have it in a movie. You could, you could quote it in a, in a play. You could, there's any number of things that could happen with those lyrics. And as the publisher of those lyrics, you control all of that. And all the publishing is really, is the creative person saying, I own this, I created it, this is my song, no one can use it unless I license it. Mm -hmm. And in order to license it, presumably, you'll have to pay me something. We'll have to work out some kind of deal where I get money for whatever you make from, from putting it out there. Sure. Um Cool. So I'd love to hear a little more about um, specifically, because I feel like in an instance like that, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about a song that I've written that let's say I record and put on SoundCloud for free, maybe someone, you know, is aware of that. And I fear, I have those fears in the back of my head that I think a lot of musicians do where it's like, I really hope no one takes this away from me. I, I haven't secured this. I haven't copyrighted this per se. Um, I do own it. I do, you know, I've indicated that I own it or done my due diligence, but there is still a lot of red tape. There's a lot of things to navigate there to make sure that you keep your property safe artistically. Um, so not to get too in depth with that specific topic, but I'd love to hear a little more about what tools or information you recommend that can assist independent artists when they begin to release music that they've written. Maybe you can describe what a first time publishing deal might look like or how certain tools and resources might apply when artists are taking that next step. Yeah, I think, um, I think you, you hit on the, a very important thing um, right off the top is that, like I said in the beginning, that copyright does exist as soon as you created it. So, mm -hmm. so you don't have to live in fear that you somehow haven't copywritten that you haven't sent it to the copyright office so therefore anybody could do anything with it um they can't they i mean they can but you have legal action to take you have you have some basis upon which to to object to that um but uh there is a process generally speaking you control the copyright as soon as you create it the copyright registration process is really something that happens uh, as a, it's essentially you're, you're registering a record that on this date you claim to own this piece of music. It doesn't mean that you do own it necessarily. It sure. just means that on this date you claimed it and you registered it with the government and the government said, okay, we have your claim. And the important, the really, the, the major reason that publishers even bother with it, and a lot of publishers don't always bother with it anymore, but the main reason you bother with it is because if, if I write a song 
and I put it up on SoundCloud and tomorrow you take it and you start doing something with it without notifying me and you start calling it your own song. I can't take legal action until I have filed a copyright claim. So I can't go to court with you until I file the copyright claim. And, and I can't get any damages that may have occurred until the point that I have filed that copyright claim. So if it takes me three months to file the claim, during that three months, the song makes a lot of money. I can't mm -hmm. go back necessarily and get that money. I can try, but I, I might not succeed. Legally, I need that document um, in order to take legal action. But that's really its primary purpose. The copyright exists already. Um, and whenever there's a copyright dispute, um, what gets looked at is not just the copyright registration form, but also the ASCAP or BMI registrations. The fact that you put it on SoundCloud and you have it registered to you on SoundCloud. Mm -hmm. um, and you can show the date at which you put it up. And, and, and so all of those kinds of records while not carrying the legal weight of a copyright registration form, they do have significance. So it's important for songwriters in terms of protecting themselves to, to keep records of everything. Keep records of the date you put the song up on SoundCloud. Keep records of the date you wrote the song. Keep records of where you recorded the song and with whom and who was in the room. All of those kinds of things, because if there's ever any question, that those are the kind of records that are going to be most significant and keep those notebooks in which the lyrics are written in. Because right. in many cases, I have a good friend uh, who's a big, big copyright lawyer. And she was telling me about a case with, that involved Mick Jagger and Nile Rodgers at one point. And hmm. what won the case for Mick Jagger was the fact that he had those little notebooks. He it keeps them meticulously. He keeps all his work tapes. He keeps all his, his notebooks. And he had them. And, and those make a difference in these situations. So definitely the important thing is to keep records. The other thing I always say that you have to be careful with copyright is that a lot of times songwriters get very caught up in thinking, oh, what if, what if a stranger takes it? What if I put this song up on SoundCloud and tomorrow some other guy is taking it and singing it and calling it his song? Sure, yeah. Which can happen, definitely. It can happen, it has happened, and, but, 95% of the time, the danger is not from people you don't know. The danger much more often is from the circle of people you work with. And people don't like to think about this, but that's the truth. Most songs that are caught in copyright disputes are not disputes between two strangers who never met. They're two guys who wrote the song together. And now this guy thinks he wrote 80% of it and I wrote 20% and I think just the opposite. That's much more common. Or, or this other guy who was running the soundboard, the mixing board while we were recording this song in the other room thinks he was part of the process because he came in and he threw in a line or two that we mm. never used. Like those are the kind of disputes more often that occupy the copyright, when it comes to copyright disputes, those are the kind of things that really occupy the time. Very rarely is it something where, you know, I played it and some guy heard it and then he just took it and called it his own. Um, it's not to say it doesn't happen, it's just to say that your, your biggest threat, your immediate threat is misunderstandings, not, not even necessarily malicious behavior, but misunderstandings between the people who were there. I played a bass line while you were doing this. You don't think I'm a songwriter for having played that bass line, and I think I am. That's sure. the kind of, that's, those are the kind of threats that really most of the time you're dealing with as a songwriter. And again, the most important thing is to hold on to those, those records so that you know who was in the room, you know when you did it, you know who, was, who recorded it and where. Mm -hmm. um, and you know how to get in touch with all the people who were involved. You have their phone numbers or their emails. You can immediately get in touch with the people who were involved. The other thing that I talk a lot about in my book, Making Music Make Money, and also my course, Music Publishing 101, to the point where most of the people who've taken them or read them just go like, enough, please. But <laughs> I always say it is so important to get signed 
agreements between the songwriters, the creators, if you're creating stuff. Now, if you're, if you're writing stuff on your own, that's not a problem. But if you're writing with other people, it's so important to have some kind of simple letter that says, we agree, you own 50%, I own 50%, or whatever the split we want to work out is. But something in writing that states that and is signed by both parties. 95% of the problems in music publishing come from a lack of that. Um, so that will save you, that will save you much more time and effort and grief than anything else. If you can just get that, there are tools now that help with that. Um, one I like a lot is oddly a U D I think it's a U D D. I think it's a U D L L Y. There's a double letter in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> but oddly is, sort of a, a system by which writers can communicate with each other and they can adjust the splits and they can make immediate agreements about it and go back and forth. If a third writer shows up and adds something, you can go back in, adjust the splits to allow for the third writer. It's, a, it's, it's just an online system for managing your copyrights. But that's definitely one we're checking out for songwriters who write in groups of more than one or two people. You know, if you if you write every song with the same person or you write everything yourself, it's not so important. But if you write with a number of different people um, in groups of three or four or six or eight, um, then then it becomes really useful. Not to jump ahead to the Q&A, but we have a question that came in from Emily. Uh, thank you, Emily, for your question. I think it fits perfectly into this conversation that we're having, Eric. Uh, it's all about just registering a copyright and how to handle the copyright when you collaborate with another artist. So Emily asks how you would go about registering that specific copyright after collaborating with the artist. And how do you bring this topic up when collaborating? What's kind of the thought and communication process between two writers or artists that are trying to collaborate, but that also want to make sure that their priorities and their paperwork is in order? Right. Um, I would probably say, I mean, it, you know, obviously there are variations on this depending on your relationship with the artist and how big the artist is or whether the artist has a record label involved or, or you know, there's always different elements in this. But I would say that generally speaking, when you're collaborating, I would probably focus on trying to get the registrations at ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or whatever society you have in your in your country um, copyright is strange it differs obviously by country um, in a lot of places it's not necessary to file with the copyright office in some places there isn't even a copyright office in those instances usually the society the performing and, and mechanical rights society and usually there's just one of them in america there's there's three but <laughs> in most countries there's just one like like CI in Italy or, 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 um, or Buma Stemra in Holland or whatever it is. Um, usually those registrations that you put in at those societies will function essentially as the copyright. Um, they, gotcha. because they're in, in instances where there isn't a, a formal copyright system. Um, so I would try to get those in um, relatively early. Now, in some places, like I know I do a lot of work in Italy. In, in Italy, it's tricky because a lot of times they, they have a slightly different system for doing that. Very different than the United States, but slightly different than a lot of other countries as well, um, where a lot of times one publisher will, will deposit the song in CI. Um, and so you have to figure that out amongst the various publishers as to who that's going to be and then mm -hmm. someone will make a deposit. In the United States and the UK, just to keep it simple, it is possible for each writer to register their share of the song. So assuming you've written a song with someone and you both agree on what those shares are gonna be, so you know what your share is, then I would encourage you to at least focus on getting your share registered. Um, what I try to do, when I'm registering at ASCAP or BMI, um, which I've just been doing for an artist that I work with, um, mm -hmm. what I'll try to do with her is I'll try to get the information of the other songwriters, um, which means I need their real name, 
not their not their pseudonym or their stage name or I need their their real legal name. Hmm. I need to know, preferably, I need to know if they are ASCAP or BMI or or CSAC if they're in the United States or if they're CI or PRS or or whoever it is SASM in Europe. But I need to know what society they're affiliated. I'd like to know what's called their IPI number. And the IPI is basically your international identification number as a songwriter. And if you're a member of say ASCAP or BMI, you can look at your registrations and you'll see it there listed CAE slash IPI. That's your number. Um, Most songwriters will not know their IPI number. I never knew mine, I still don't know mine. Um, absolutely no idea now that I think about it. Just another number to memorize. Yeah, I mean, who's going to remember like a nine-digit number that, yeah, they're not. (laughs) So if you can't get the IPI, it's not the end of the world. You can look it up um, and figure it out. But it's helpful if someone has it. So I I need their real name. I need their society. I need their IPI if I can. And if they have a publishing entity or a publisher in place, I need to know that. So if it might be, you know, Billy Music, ASCAP, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Or it might be Cobalt Music and you've done a deal with Cobalt. Whatever it is, I just, I, it would help me to know that. And once I have as much information of that that I can get, I can then go in and register the song. I'll try to register. I usually register everybody's share if I have the right information. I will go ahead and register the whole share just because I know a lot of other writers don't take care of it and it's better for everybody if it just goes in. But if I, if I can't, I can just register my share and leave you to deal with your share. I can register this song, Eric Beal, 50% and your name, 50%. And then you'll have to go, you then in, in the case of the UK or, or the US can go in and register the song again, showing your share and all the correct information for you. Mm -hmm. And at some point, the society, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, PRS, will combine those registrations. It'll go for a while. If you look up a relatively new song at PRS, a lot of times you'll see four or five registrations for it. Right, Um, right. All of them similar, but slightly different. Mm -hmm. And, and, at certain point, all those will get melded and then you'll have the official registration. But at least you've made your claim, you're there, you have a claim in place. They can't meld it unless your share is represented the way you registered it. So Mm -hmm. I think that's the best practice. In terms of putting in an actual copyright registration, that if I'm writing with an artist, I will probably allow them to do that because they'll probably register the sound recording and the copyright all at once. Gotcha. Um, and that's usually a more efficient way to do that. So I'll usually allow them to do it. Now, if they don't do it for some reason, then I would go in and put, and put it in. And again, for the copyright registration, I need that same information um people's actual legal names i need to know their percentages and then i can enter that copyright registration Mm -hmm. well i wanted to just shift gears a little bit we actually had a question come in from lena hi lena Uh, thank you for your question uh and it really relates to one of the next questions i wanted to ask you anyway eric you know she mentioned she's a singer songwriter um and the part that gets confusing for her and a lot of artists i think is differentiating the differences between these different kinds of organizations like you're talking about ASCAP, BMI, it seems a little less convoluted in European countries and outside of the US, but still, would you be able to just briefly touch on the differences between these navigating these organizations and what they actually do for an artist, if there are any differences between them? Yes, Um, and it is complex, and yes, it is simpler in in Europe as well, so. but not that much simpler. Um, The important thing to understand initially is that publishing, think of your publishing income as a river. And there are about four or five streams that feed into that river. Um, And those are your sources of income. And they're all different sources of income that feed into the 
the, what you actually earn as a songwriter and as a publisher. So the biggest stream that feeds into the river is called performance income. And performance income is related to the public use of your music, the public performance of your music. So music that's played in a concert hall, music that's played on the radio, music that's played on television, music that's played in a live venue, music that's played um, in a gym or, or a restaurant or a bar, anything like that, those are all considered public performances. And that's probably your biggest source of income as, as a commercial songwriter. Um, and radio and television make up a big portion of that particularly in the United States. In Europe, live music makes up a pretty big portion of that. Um, for various reasons, uh, the rates for live performance in America are very, very low. But in, in Europe, uh, the live performance can be a, an important part of your performance income. So gotcha. all that money, that money flows into the river of publishing income. ASCAP and BMI and CSAC are what's called performing rights organizations. That means they are basically, they go out and they collect that public performance income that I just described. Mm -hmm. So they collect the money from the radio stations, the TV stations, the live venues, the restaurants, the gyms, all of that stuff. In order for anyone to use music in a public way, at least in theory, they have to have a license from ASCAP, and BMI, or CSAC. As a songwriter and a publisher, you will choose one of those organizations to collect on your behalf those performing rights. Because obviously for you to go and collect from every radio station in America is pretty damn daunting. Right. You're not gonna do that. You do not. So not to make a crude analogy or anything, but maybe BMI or ASCAP is almost like the net that you're able to cast into this river to catch exactly. what you need. They're it. the ones responsible for catching your fish. Gotcha. And, gotcha. And they they go out and they collect all this money and they keep track of where your songs are used and how much they're used and and they have various ways of doing that. It's not foolproof, but it's pretty good. And they then collect all that money, that performing rights money, and they pay out to the songwriter for half of it and to the publisher for half of it. So if you are if you write a song, Billy Walsh gets 50%, your music company gets the other 50%. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and you choose one of those organizations. Now in most countries in the world, there is only one organization that does that. The U S sure. is somewhat unique in that we have three, possibly four. Um, there's another company called GRM that is a run by Irving Azoff that, emerged maybe five years ago that is also a performing rights organization. Um, mm -hmm. They cater only to the top, top, top echelon of songwriters. It's a very limited company. They haven't really even licensed much. It's a bit premature to discuss them, but, but there are three in the United States. In most countries, there is only, there's only one. Um, gotcha. So that's one stream, your performing rights income. There's another stream called mechanical rights, and that represents the mechanical recording of your music. In other words, record companies, for the most part. Um, anyone that makes a mechanical recording of your song has to pay you in order to do that. And they pay a royalty called a mechanical royalty. It's nine cents per unit that they sell. So whether it's a big record company or a small record company, some indie labels don't really deal with mechanical rights. They just pay directly to the songwriter, but the mechanical rights still exists. They just happen to be rolling it all into one sum that they pay you. Um, but mechanicals are collected by a different organization in the United States. Um, you can collect mechanicals directly from the record label, which a lot of people do now. Um, or Harry Fox Agency used to be, and probably still is, the leading uh, society that collects for mechanical rights in the United States. Again, in Europe, 
there's usually one organization and it's usually tied to the, it's usually tied in with the performing rights organization. So you got Buma Stemra um, mm. or you have PRS for music and they collect mechanical and, and um, performance income. Where does so, streaming tie into that, if you don't mind me asking? Streaming is streaming. Ah, oh, good question, my friend. <laughs> Actually, I got to give credit to Haley Fines here in the chat. She brought it really? up. And I was curious. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> almost one in the crowd who asked the, asked the tough question. Mm -hmm. Streaming is considered both a performing right and a mechanical right mm -hmm. because it's being used publicly theoretically, I mean, it's being transmitted publicly like a radio, but over your computer. Um, but it's also considered a mechanical reproduction of your song because it basically eliminates the need for anyone to go buy a physical copy of it. Mm -hmm. So a streaming, a streaming generates both performing rights royalties and mechanical royalties. It's split about 50-50. But this is super important, super important for independent musicians because most people don't understand this. And especially a lot of, all of you who are in Europe, um, this is important to understand. In the United States, if something is streamed on Spotify, there's a performing right. And that, in, that performing rights income will go from Spotify to ASCAP or BMI or CSAC and it will get paid out to the songwriter through that and the publisher. Um, even, if you're Europe, even if you're in Europe, the money will flow to ASCAP and then it will flow on to PRS or CI or SASM or whatever society represents you in the country in which you live. So it will flow through that income, that performing rights income. You'll eventually get it. It will take a while. It might take two years, but it will eventually get to you. But the, the other half of the money that you're earning is mechanical royalties, mechanical income. And that mechanical income in the United States will not flow through you. Hmm. So if you're a European writer, you get your money, your performance money through your local society, but that mechanical money will just sit at Harry Fox or whoever administers for the various streaming services, and it won't get paid out. You need to be a member of Harry Fox, or you basically, you need a US publisher or an administrator to go in and collect that money for you. Otherwise, you're losing about half your money. Um, if you're in the United States, um, the money can be paid directly to you, but it will be paid through Harry Fox to your publishing entity. It will not gotcha. go through. It'll, it, it will not go through a society in that sense. But it's important to understand that streaming creates both kinds of income, and it will not necessarily the mechanical side will not flow through to you. You have to go get that money. I wanted to jump around a little bit here. Thank you for that detailed explanation. Yeah, I hope that's a decent explanation. It's, it's a complex subject, but it's important for people to understand because there's a lot of people who are losing. It. The money for publishing on, on streaming services is not great to begin with. Right. Um, but you don't want to lose half of it. And right. a, lot of times, a lot of times you are. Now that may change in the future, but at the moment, that's the situation. Right. Um, no, I mean, it's definitely complex, but I think you did such a great job of kind of breaking things down. And again, we'll always have this recording to refer back to. Uh, yeah, you can watch this over and over and over again until it finally starts to make sense. Take your notes. There you go. Um, yeah. But yeah, just for the sake of time, given we want to leave some time for some of the excellent questions coming okay. through. I think a few questions that I have left pertain to some of the questions coming through here as well. So it works out both ways, but wanted to touch on publishing contracts and deals for a little bit, Eric. Okay. Um, specifically, you know, when an artist is approaching the idea of working with a publishing company, what should they expect from the company itself in terms of their responsibility to the artist versus the responsibilities of the artists themselves? You know, how does that share of the work uh, come to be when you decide to work with a publishing company as an independent artist? Yeah, this is really important and it, it hits close to home because I was a songwriter for many years and I had 
three different publishing deals with different companies. Um, some of which were good, but none of them perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I am that publisher. So all my writers say the same thing. Like he's good. Full circle. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. so it's, it's really, it's, it's a really good question. Um, for, for writers in terms of their expectation of a publisher, I think at the very least you need to be able to expect the, the administration side. And it's important to understand that there are different kinds of publishing deals. There is, Generally speaking, not too many people do full publishing deals anymore. Sometimes in certain parts of Europe they do and in certain genres that maybe generate less money. Um, a full publishing deal would mean that I publish you, I, I collect 100% of the money and I pay you 50%, your writer's share, and I keep 50% as the publisher's share. Mm -hmm. That's, like I said, somewhat rare these days. But it is, and sometimes it's valid to do that if, if if you're a classical writer or something, you really don't earn that much, then maybe it, it means it, it makes sense for me to do it that way. Sure. Most of the time, what you're seeing now are what's called co-publishing deals. Co-publishing means that you keep your 50% writer's share and you keep half of the publisher's share. So I publish you, I go out and I collect $100. I pay you 50 as a songwriter and I pay 25 to your publishing entity or to you as acting as your publishing entity. And I keep the other 25%. Hmm. The third kind is an administration deal. An administration deal is different in that you don't actually assign any rights to me. You're really just hiring me to provide a service. You're saying, okay, I don't want to bother with all this paperwork. You go out and collect the money bring it back to me and you can take a percentage off the top and then just pay me my money. And for, for an administration deal, generally speaking, the publisher will keep somewhere between 10 and 20%, um, depending on how much you bring in, how, how, um, how many songs there are and, and other factors. But you have to, as a writer, adjust your expectations according to the kind of deal you do. So if you do a co-publishing deal, I think you do it with the expectation that the writer, the publisher is going to try to support you creatively as well as just collecting your money. Mm -hmm. um, the publisher is going to hopefully look for opportunities that you wouldn't necessarily find on your own. That might mean getting the song into movies or TV shows or video. Sure. Games. It might mean getting it into a greeting card. It might, mean, um, it might mean looking for opportunities for that song to be recorded by another artist in a different territory. Um, mm -hmm. Those are all things that I think are legitimate expectations of a publisher. Publishers won't always do that, but, but I think it's fair to expect that they will try. It's also important as a songwriter, if you're very precious about your songs, and, and you don't want anyone else recording your song. And you don't want anyone doing a, a, a version in Spanish. And you really don't want it put in an advertisement because you don't like the, pro if that's how you feel, that's great. But you shouldn't do a co-publishing deal. Because gotcha. that, that, you know, you're, you're asking someone to do a job and then you're not letting them do it. So you, you have to understand a publisher is in this thing for the business. Their job is to make money. Your job is to create art. My job is to make money. And so if we do a publishing deal, I assume that you want me to go out and find as many opportunities as possible. So you need to adjust your expectations based on that. If you really don't want the publisher to do that, or maybe for a lot of artists, I mean, I work with a lot of, of, of hip hop producers right now, they don't really need a publisher. They, they send their beats directly to the artists, directly to the managers, they're getting on records, they're happy with what they're doing, they just want someone to collect the money. That's when you would do an administration deal. And with an administration deal, the expectation of the publisher really is not that they're going to open doors for you in the industry, although some may, and I certainly try when I have an opportunity, but, but for the most part, the expectation is I'm going to go out and I'm going to make sure your song is registered all over the world. And I'm going to make sure that any, any money that should be coming to you is flowing through collect correctly and I'm collecting it and then I'm sending it to you. And any 
if you get someone saying, hey, I want to use your song in my TV show, then mm -hmm. I will handle the license. I'll take care of that. I'll make it happen. I'll negotiate the rate and I'll pay you your money. But that's gotcha. the expectation um, on, uh, I think, of a, of a songwriter to a publisher. So a co-publishing deal implies creative input, um, someone to support you creatively. A, a administration deal really just implies that you're going to collect the money and register gotcha. the songs and protect them. I think from a publisher standpoint, the best thing that a songwriter can bring to the equation, other than great songs, which is obvious, um, but not easy, uh, <laughs> the most important the and challenging most, yeah, part. Actually, the yeah. most single most difficult thing in the world to do, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, they expect great songs. They also, they really, our effectiveness depends on the quality of the paperwork that you submit to us. Mm -hmm. The more information you can give, the more information about who are the co-writers, who owns what share, the tighter that is, the better. And that's what will allow a publisher to do their job on the administration side. If you can't tell them that information, then they can't administer your song. So there's no use asking them to do it. And that was one thing I wanted to touch on just because I, these hours always fly by for me. And we're getting to the point where we do definitely want to answer some of the wow. questions yeah. that are coming through. Yeah, 45 minutes in already. Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on, one last thing, all in relation to this, Eric, and from the seat that you're at and the jobs that you do right now, I think it's really relevant to independent artists to get your point of view on this. A lot of artists had asked, you know, what is the best way to pitch or bring to the table their songs, you know, when seeking a publishing deal? What are publishers really looking for from an artist when maybe you're building a network of connections as an independent musician, you're still figuring out this whole thing in terms of music publishing, but you know you want to take those next steps and you know you want to put together a pitch deck or a, you know, portfolio to pitch. So what do you look for in those situations? And, you know, maybe you could summarize that before we dive into some of these uh, audience Q&A. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, the, the truth of it is, is that the one thing, and I talk about this a lot in Music Publishing 101, it's almost the, it's almost kind of the, the whole point of the course, is that songwriters really need to figure, they need to become their own publisher first, in the creative sense, not necessarily in the administrative sense, but in the creative sense, they need to become their own publishers, they need to try to get something out there that's generating money before a publisher is gonna get involved. That's just the cold facts of life. Not very many publishers right now are getting a set of demos saying, wow, this guy sounds great, and signing them. They're looking at what is this person, who are they connected with, are they getting songs on records? Are there, if they're an artist, are their own records doing well? Are they, gener are they do they look like they have potential as an artist? Mm -hmm. um, are they earning something? Is there a territory where they're doing really well? Um, I'm working with a songwriter right now who has a piece of a, a dance record that's blowing up in the UK. This girl is no better a songwriter than she was six months ago when I first met her, but now I can probably go out and get her a publishing deal. There's because, some momentum there. Because yeah. she's got a story and because there's money out there to collect and the publishers are returning the call. And, and that's, that's the way the reality of it works. That said, I'm always listening to new writers. I'm always checking out new stuff. In part, it may be, and I think it's important for songwriters to understand this, you'll have a lot of meetings with publishers and they'll say, oh, I love your stuff. Oh, we gotta do stuff together. You should meet so-and-so and they'll put to, they might put together some co-writes, things like that. That's what publishers do as they're waiting to see whether this is gonna develop. They're not saying, no, I don't want to sign you. They're saying, I don't want to sign you yet. Yeah. Because I don't know for sure that there's going to be money there. So I will always listen to stuff. And if I hear something I think is interesting, I have a meeting and I say, hey, let's try to do some things together. Let's, let me, here's a couple of tracks. Do you want to write to them? Hey, uh, I think you'd be great with this other writer who's in town from Belgium this week. Do you want to get together with them? We'll try to set up things like that, get that process started, and then see if it develops into something where there's money out there. That's what I'll do if I see a writer who's not really earning anything yet, but I believe they have the potential to do so in the future. 
So you'll try to get involved on a creative level and start spreading it a little and see how it goes. Um, in terms of doing that, I think, you know, it's always helpful to a publisher to hear things that are, um, depending on the style of music, of course, but sort of record level, like release level quality. Um, mm -hmm. If I hear a song and I, I, it sounds like it could go on TV tomorrow, or it could go in a movie tomorrow, or it could go in a video game tomorrow, that's always easier than hearing sure. a rough demo. And then there's not, not much I can immediately do with that. Like, Hard to use your imagination when yeah, if all of these things are in play. It's a, a basically a finished product, then at least I can immediately say like, hey, I think I know a label that would like this and I can mm -hmm. send it. If it's just a rough idea, that's harder. Now, one exception to that would be the EDM world, where mm -hmm. a lot of times the best thing I can get is just a piano vocal or something very simple with a top line on it and I can send it out to a bunch of DJs and producers and they'll take care of making the track. Gotcha. Um, so it depends on the genre, but you want to deliver people the music in the way that it works best for your genre. So if you're, you know, if, if you are a top of someone that writes melodies and lyrics for EDM songs, the best thing you can give me is a bunch of, is, is some, you know, relatively simple ideas, um, but that fit that genre and are the right tempo. And, mm -hmm. And then I'll send it out and I'll try to get something happening. If you're an independent artist who's more of a singer songwriter and you think your songs should be on TV, then I really need a version of it that is ready to go. Um, you know, and I gotcha. would say most of the time, the better thing is to, I don't like to send more than three pieces of music at a time unless someone specifically requests that, that they want more than that. Keep it cohesive. Um, yeah, I, I think three of your best songs, your most commercial songs, are probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, the if there's nothing wrong with sending one song, one great song. I mean, the girl I was talking about that I'm looking for a publishing deal for right now. You know, I I, I can send other stuff of hers, but it's the one song that's going to get a publishing deal, or is. You know, so sure. So in the end, one great song usually trumps three good songs. Right, that so makes don't sense. Be yeah, if you've got one that's killer and that people are responding to. Just, just go with that. Quality over quantity. Uh, mm -hmm. Now I'm going to throw a curveball at you here. We got a few folks uh, that are actually submitting questions here. Aloha, Ashton, all the way from Hawaii, and we've got really? Selena as well. Selena Solomon. Very similar questions, uh, but they ask about owning your own publishing companies or starting your own labels. So rather than going through someone else's publishing company, Ashton asks, and I think it encompasses Selena's question here too about owning her own publishing company, says, I'm an artist looking to start my own label. Where would, I be, where would it be best for me to register my label and how can I maximize my profit by releasing music on my own label? Is, is this a good route for some musicians to go? Or, you know, is, I, I see, Musicians that have built quite a following that end up starting their own labels and self-producing and it seems to work for them. But for musicians that are still starting out and paving this groundwork, how does that work for them? Yeah, no, I think it, I think it definitely does work. I think it's, you know, and, um, you know, I, I think, I don't think the place where you do it is terribly important. I think the distributor can be important. Um, if, if you're starting your own label, I think that the distribution becomes the most important segment that they're, they're going to be your most important initial partner, probably in the mm -hmm. label, even though they may not do anything for the first couple releases, except get it out there. But eventually, if you start to build a good set of releases for them, they will start to respond to you and they will become a, a partner on your team. So um, there's a million companies, everyone from DistroKid to TuneCore to Believe to, you know, there's, there's a lot of them. I think the important thing is you find someone, if you can, that responds to the music and believes in you and, and really try to build a relationship there if you can. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think any of these companies, I mean, DistroKid has you know, really emerged. I mean, they've had some big hit records over the, over the last couple of years. So right. there's, there's nothing that limits these companies really. 
if they get the right record. Um, AWOL is another one through Cobalt. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends. You want to pick someone, though, that's the right size. If I, were a, if I were a first release, if this were my first release, I wouldn't put it out through AWOL. They're too big. They have too many important artists. You're going to get lost. I would go through something smaller or something where I could, you know, have a I, where I wasn't quite so lost amidst a big group of name artists. Um, hmm. So I think it's it's mainly about the distribution side. But I want to make really clear because we're talking about music publishing, the label. If you start your own label, that's not the same as starting your own music publishing company. Hmm. Um, Okay. The label controls the master recordings. So those specific recordings of those songs. The publishing company controls the songs themselves, not the recordings. So as an example, um, you know, if, if you write a song and you put it out on Billy's records, mm -hmm. you also have Billy's publishing. And the reason this is important, I mean, at that point, all the money flows to you anyway. If you were, I like the sound of that. Oh, yeah, it doesn't really I got this yeah, whole really empire now. Because it's all your <laughs> stuff. But here's what's important about it. Billy's Records only cares about that record. They care about getting as many streams as they can on that recording of that song. Mm -hmm. Billy's Publishing cares about all the things that could happen with that song. Maybe a country version could be done and a big country artist could record it. Mm -hmm. Billy's Publishing cares about that. Maybe, maybe you could do it in Spanish and break it in that market. Billy's Publishing cares about that. Billy's Records doesn't give a shit, really. So yeah. Billy's Records cares yeah. about Billy's what Records it is. Billy's Records just owns that one recording. Right, they care about what it is. Billy's Publishing cares about what it could be. Exactly, very good, yeah, now that's a great way of, and, and that's really important. I mean, I was listening to, I was, I was doing some research the other day and I came across this record that just is starting to break in the dance market called Pour the Milk. But it interpolates a song called Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega that she did. I love that song. Early. Yeah. Yeah, incredible song. The quintessential singer-songwriter and the quintessential singer-songwriter song. I mean, it's a song that just kind of wanders from topic to topic, you know. For, it doesn't sound like a hit record, really. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. But it was then redone by DNA, and that's when it really became a massive hit. And now it's been used again, what, 40 years later, um, in a new club record um, that's starting to blow up as well. So that's, Billy's publishing cares about those moments. They care about the long-term value of this song and all the things that this song could be used for. Mm -hmm. Whereas Billy's records only cares about the, distribu the distribution of this particular recording at this particular moment. Well, it's so interesting that you bring that up too, because I think about Prince is a great example of a musician Amazing. that's written for so many other, you know, nothing compares to you, an originally a Prince song yeah. that Sinead O'Connor then took and made absolutely yeah. incredibly famous, you know, with her rendition. Yeah. But that actual track itself wasn't released until after Prince had passed away. Uh, with you know his like uh, songs written for other people that was yeah. really it's it's an excellent album of songs that you recognize a ton but might not have realized Prince released and uh, or recorded and that's interesting there where Prince you know in his empire as you know the musician that he was maybe keeps those songs in the vault and uses them for publishing but yeah. hasn't released them on a record because the publishing might be more fruitful might be more might make more fiscal sense in the time being, but now posthumously, it makes sense to release these recordings now and see what the label yeah. can do or the, the records can yeah. do. That's well, interesting. Here's the really interesting thing too, and it's a, it's a good thing for songwriters to keep in mind. The publishing will probably be your longest term, val your biggest value long term, but it's long term in the immediate, in the day to day, it will not do you nearly as well as live income or even streaming income. But, mm -hmm. but in the long term, I guarantee you, Suzanne Vega has made far more off Tom's Diner than she's made off of all the records she put out as an artist. Mm -hmm. Because that song has endured and it's gone on much longer. The problem with recordings is no matter how brilliant they are, they date. 
they get old, they change, styles change, things, they don't sound as good as they used to because just sonically the technology is different. So mm -hmm. recordings date, songs do not date as much. And, and that means that they are your long-term investment. And usually, especially right now, you're seeing a lot of songwriters my age or even younger who are selling their publishing. I mean, David Guetta just sold his publishing off to a lot of his big hits. Um, hmm. um, Danger has sold his. I mean, there's a lot of guys that have done deals selling their publishing rights. Jeff Basker. Um, and they're doing that because this is your, like, this publishing is your long-term value and it gets more and more of it. It's like a 401k. It just keeps kind of building up. And as you get older as a songwriter or musician, that's what you're that's that's your retirement plan is that mm -hmm. you've got this catalog of songs that you've built up and now it's going to have value and that's what's going to allow you to at, at some point sell it or pass it on to your kids man it's been such a great conversation with you eric we, we only have time for one more question here so i wanted to thank everybody so much for all of the really fantastic yeah, thank questions you, everybody. that were submitted. I, I apologize we weren't able to get to them all, um, but just wanted to recap things here by first off, uh, you know, thanking you, Eric, for your time and everything today. This has just been a fantastic in session. And I wanted to ask just from the perspective of independent musicians who are still navigating this and have questions around navigating a deal or working with an organization, uh, really quickly, just 30 second, if you can. Uh, does it make sense for an artist to have a publishing deal at some point in their career always, or can there be monetary success without one? Is, is a publishing deal an, an inevitable or is it possible to go a different route? I think it's absolutely possible to go a different route. There are, there's no question you could go your whole career and not have a publishing deal. What you cannot do is not collect your publishing. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a publishing deal, you still have a publisher, it's you. So you have to learn to be that publisher. The people who have survived by not having publishing deals are, are very, very good publishers. And they know mm -hmm. all the things that I've just talked about. Right Those, the, if, and, and that's really the point of Music Publishing 101 at, my, at um, Berkeley Online, is that you need to learn to be your own publisher. And you need to learn and understand all of it. And if you do that, you can very feasibly be your own publisher your whole career. Um, I will say that in the last five years, publishing has gotten very, very complex because of streaming and because of some international issues. If I were doing it today, I probably, if I had my own publishing company, which I do actually, I would have an administrator. I would probably look for someone to provide the administration service because that's a lot of work and it's very complex. And it's not, if you're a creative person, it's probably not the best investment of your time. But you could do it. You certainly could learn to do it. But sure. I would probably, if I were an independent musician and I didn't want a publishing deal, I would do it with an administrator, someone to handle my administration. And it could be as simple as signing up with a service like Centric, um, Music is Very Good, or Song Trust. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that simple and they'll handle your administration and you'll run your publishing company. Um, I think that's a good option. You do a publishing deal basically because you either want or need or feel you need the creative support, someone to try to find opportunities for you. And if you're going to be your own publisher, then that means it's on you to figure out how to get your songs in movies and on TV and in video games and just that's on you. So right. if you want to do that, that's great. Um, but you, you generally look to a publisher to help you do that, or you do it to get money mm -hmm. because a publisher will often advance you money. It's very, very important to understand they're just advancing you. They're not paying you. They're just advancing mm -hmm. you. But sometimes that's very good. I mean, if you have no money and I got to pay it back out of my earnings later, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. I was very happy sure. to get my advances when I was a songwriter. <laughs> um, so if you need the money, you can do a publishing deal. If you need the creative support, um, or if you honestly just don't want to deal with the, the various publishing issues that come up, um, you know, that would be if you just want the administrative support. 
Um, that would be another reason. But primarily you do it either for creative reasons or to get the advance check or both, you know, or some combination of the two. Otherwise, you can definitely do it on your own, but you need to learn it. You can't, you can't not do it. Right. You, you have say, to I don't know about publishing and I don't care because then you're li literally leaving a lot of money on the table. You're leaving what should be probably your biggest income stream as an independent musician. You're just leaving that on the table. Education is key folks. That's the end education of it. You just got to learn or have somebody to teach you. Uh, Eric, really quick. Speaking of education, what's the name of the book that you'd written again? Um, it's uh, the, my first book was called making music, make money. And it's all about music publishing and it is still available, but there is a new edition coming out at the end of the year. So as oh. much as I'd love to have all your money now, <laughs> I'd rather you wait until the end of the year and buy the up-to-date edition because the edition now is quite old. So right on. the second cool. edition is out, I believe at the end of this year. So I would encourage you to look for that. Um, there are other good books about music publishing. This business of music is always good. Um, the Kravzlovsky book. Um, there's uh, a book by Randall Wixon that's quite good that I like a lot that I use in the class. Um, so there are books out there and also there's of course Music Publishing 101 at Berkeley Online, which is very much based on the same idea as the book, which is how to be your own music publisher, how to take control of those publishing rights and try to turn your music into money.